Welcome to another episode of Track It. This is episode three of the turbo conversion series. And guys, this one's not gonna be fun. It's about wiring. It's a really boring subject to watch a video on, but I'll try and keep it interesting because there was a lot of wiring done on this car whilst I was doing the turbo conversion. And it's something that I almost didn't account for when I was putting together my schedule of how long I wanted this build to take. So today I'm gonna to go over the um, steps that I went through, all of the tools that I used, and then show you the final result. Now, there is a really big difference between good wiring and bad wiring. And bad wiring is probably that time you wanted to fit a sub to your car when you were 17 and you had no idea how to put the power wire through the bulkhead or where to put the earth or whether you needed a fuse. And good wiring is what you see in a car when you get it out of the factory. Now, I try to do my wiring as best as possible because it ensures reliability of everything that you do. So, without further ado, let's jump into the toolbox. These are the bits that I use for wiring then and nothing complicated here, so let's just scoot over these as quickly as possible. The first one is a set of wiring diagrams and if you don't have a set of these um, I'd really recommend getting them they are really really useful if you're doing anything more complicated than just a gauge install but you need the reference material for them otherwise interpreting them is going to be pretty difficult then I've just got a pretty standard selection of tools here so first one is a multimeter that's normally used for checking voltage on something um, and also continuity this one makes a nice beep when you have a good connection between um, two wires and a pretty invaluable bit of kit. On the cup, I did two types of wiring. Some of it was from scratch using this um, reel of automotive grade wiring. And it's automotive grade because it has good insulation on it, which doesn't crack at the first sign of heat. I also used a donor loom and that's where these um, wiring keys come in and they allow you to de-pin standard connections and um, utilize those great um, thousand pound crimping machine type crimps um, and also get really good reliability. So highly recommend you get some of these. Then once you've worked out where all your wires go and um, you've got all your pins out or you've got your wires in, you wanna connect everything together. So here I've got some wire strippers um, to take the ends off the wires. This one just opens like this. Um, and this one's an automatic type. Um, and when you're doing something like a gauge install, you need to think about um, what you're gonna do with it in the future. Are you gonna take that gauge out or are you gonna take that piece of equipment out? And if so, um, do you wanna cut the wires or do you wanna have a nice connection for it? So this is a type of connection that you would use um, on the interior of a car. You use a simple ratcheting crimper like this, and these can be had really, really cheap. It's total overkill to use connections like this because they can take massive current, but very easy to come across, super cheap. This whole um, setup of crimps and the bit here is probably less than 10 pounds. If you're using it in the um, engine bay, then um, just get a pre-wired super seal like this to protect it from the elements, um, and you should get pretty good reliability using that. The other method of connecting stuff together is of course soldering, and I use soldering on loads of stuff, and if you get these pre-wired connectors, you're gonna have to solder the ends of them anyway to um, whatever you're connecting. If you're doing soldering though, I would recommend that you get some um, heat shrink. And heat shrink comes in loads of different shapes and sizes. Um, if you're using it on the inside of a car, get some non-adhesive stuff. Um, but if you're using it in the engine bay, um, then I would recommend getting some um, adhesive. It normally is in a two to one shrink ratio. Um, and you probably want a heat gun for doing this, not a lighter because um, you'll just burn the insulation on, on whatever you're um, connecting together. Once you've got everything connected though, you wanna make it look pretty. Um, and that's where these bits come in. So this is non-adhesive loom tape, which is great for the um, inside of a car. I've got cloth tape here, which is um, BMW factory finish. Um, and then pretty standard insulation tape, which is used for finishing off the ends of the non-adhesive loom tape or some conduit like this to connect the conduit to the wire and stop it moving around. The reason you'd want to use conduit over loom tape is that if you use loom tape, the wires become very formed and relatively rigid. Perfect for doing a dash loom, but um, not so perfect for something in the engine bay where you might want to connect something and disconnect it quite a lot and you need a little bit more flexibility in that wire. So I've used a combination of um, all of these on the car as you'll see now. So let's roll a couple of clips of me doing hundreds of hours of work on the Clio in about 30 seconds.
Let me show you something. This is the connector for the um, oil temper and pressure gauge and a separate gauge loom with its own connector. Then we've got the battery cables for the cutoff and then all of this is integrated into the main, um, main dashboard loom. On there, I've got things like electronic power steering, 12 volt socket, CAN bus, uh, OBD2 connector and the ignition um, wires that are gonna go to the cutoff. I've also got the uh, USB as well and a couple of other bits. I'll show you the dashboard that that's gonna be going into. This fits over the um, normal dashboard where the clock would be, that would normally be kind of here, um, and it's also angled slightly towards the driver like a BMW cockpit. I'll just go over quickly what I've got on here. These are switches um, to turn the uh, gauge on and off, but also the shift light. Um, of course, a 12 volt socket. This is the original Renault one with the idea that I can use the factory wiring. Then this is the potentiometer for the electronic power steering. And these two switches are on off on switches for the um, back lights in the car and the front lights, the interior lights. So uh, setting one is gonna be a battery protected connection with the idea that if I turn these lights on when the car is off, then this uh, will be controlled by the body control module and make sure that the battery doesn't go flat and it will turn them off when it's uh, when the voltage drops to a certain point setting two will be just like normal operation when the doors open on the car the lights will come on i've opted to have the off um, section in the middle because i don't always want the lights to come on for example when i get into the car why do i want the lights in the back to come on um, i'm probably going to leave those off most of the time the reason i installed this one is because when I'm tinkering around in the back of the car at night, you know, going through tools or whatever, or I break down or something, then I do need to have lights in the back. Then here I've got, um, this is the E-Pass switch, just simple on and off. This is a power to the control box. And this one here is for the boost solenoid with the idea that I can isolate that if there are any issues with the electronic boost control system. This is a um, standard, uh, USB socket, it's nothing special, um, but it's a panel mount one, it takes a 22 mil hole, got this from RS Online. Down here I've got a fused connection, this is uh, fused so that when the key is taken out of here, power can still um, pass between the, the terminals with the idea that you will still be able to lock the car, but you certainly wouldn't be able to start it. The one on the left is uh, the OBD2 connector. This is the um, shape for that. I actually made that using a template from a Clio. So this is the original bracket which uh, sits in the car. So I've squashed it down a bit and measured it and replicated that on there. On the top, I've got a GoPro mount and I'm probably not gonna have my GoPro mounted on the top of this, but um, it gives me the option to do that. What I'm gonna do with this is create a phone mount so that I can have a sat nav when, the, uh, when I'm obviously driving to track. That's something that um, could very easily be overlooked. On the back, this is how I've wired it up um, and it looks like a nightmare, but it's really not too bad at all. The USB is a standard 10 pin PC header um, with two pins for ground on each one and a single for uh, single for 12 volts, sorry, five volts. Then um, this is the, the loop from the fuse that will go here. I've then started to wire up this. The rest of the wires that go onto the terminals here are in the main dash loom. There'll be a connector that goes into the back of the gauge. The screw for the <laughs> GoPro mount is actually the bottom of a selfie stick. Then here I've separated these two. So these are wires which are integrated into the dash loom. And then, as I said earlier in the video, I've done a separate gauge related loom, um, which is completely separable from the dash loom. So that's where these wires go. These are 6.3 millimeter eight way connectors. They're really easy to put together, providing that you've got the right crimp tool. Um, and uh, of course they give you this really nice detachable finish. So here it is in the car then. And the one you're probably gonna be most interested in is this switch here. Now, if you look closely, you can see that the EPAS ECU is powering up and it extinguishes once it's at full power. But I've also wired that ECU into the 
CAN bus network so it can be properly diagnosed through the OBD2 port here. Everything else works perfectly though. So this is the oil temp and pressure gauge. This is a SPA signature series. Um, if you're wondering what that one is, that's the shift light, the front lights here, and the rear lights as well. The boost solenoid switch does of course work, but you can't sample that without the engine running and without being on boost. One thing I haven't mentioned though is that this car runs factory modules. So down here is the airbag ECU. And if I turn the ignition on and off, you can see the airbag light coming on here and also the ABS light. And these extinguish just with a little bit of reprogramming on Renault can clip to make sure that um, the lights work as expected. The engine light is nothing to do with the conversion. It's the fact that I've got a Lambda sensor unplugged at the moment. So you can uh, ignore that one. Then I've got the piggyback ECU, which is mounted onto the bottom of the glove box. So let's go into the engine bay and I'll show you how I've wired this into the factory ECU. Unfortunately, this engine bay is pretty crammed full of turbo stuff, but I'll show you what I can. Now, if you cast your mind back to the clip before we went into the car, you'll remember I was cutting a hole through the bulkhead and that's just below this catch can here. I've protected that with some built hamber zinc coat because it's quite close to the wheel arch and I've used a Delphi Aptiv grommet in there to keep the cabin isolated from the engine bay. All of the wiring changes that I've done in here go through that grommet so it's um, very easy to detach the engine loom from um, the dash loom as such. The ECU wires all come through here. Um, there are about 15 that are either tapped or intercepted, and it's really not that difficult to, to do this, but I've rewrapped it with um, loom tape, as you can see there. The other main visible change is the boost solenoid. Quite a simple system. It's just got 12 volts going into it, and then a ground, which is controlled at 30 hertz by the piggyback ECU. This allows you to bring the boost in a little bit quicker, but also hold it at the top end better as well. The other changes are some small wiring repairs that I did on the loom down here because um, it does get to, well the heat from the engine gets to it over the years and the insulation cracks. But I had to elongate this wire for the oil switch because of all of these stuff for the turbo oil feed. Then the spar gauge, um, very easy to wire in. It just needs a ground and a live, but uh, all of the wiring runs into the engine bay and this is the pressure sensor, and then right down there on the bottom of the sandwich plate, which I don't think you can make out, that's where the um, temperature sensor is. Now, one glaring thing is that I haven't got a battery in here, so let's go into the inside of the car and I'll show you how I relocated that. Let's start with where the power originates in this car then, and that is this Odyssey PC680 battery. It's in an aluminium cage and mounted to the uh, fuel tank bulkhead, so you have to be a little bit careful when you're drilling through here, but there is enough room to get a rivnut in there. Then I've got 25 millimeter battery cable, which I've calculated to be correct for the run I've got, but it's really important that you calculate it correctly, otherwise the car will struggle to start, and uh, particularly when it's hot. I bought a crimping tool to allow me to crimp the lugs onto the end of here and then some heat shrink to go over the top and to make it look pretty. It then earths off on one of the bolts um, just on the floor at the back and the power or the live comes into this 125 amp mega fuse connection which also takes M6 lug terminals. It then comes all the way along here, goes up, goes into the cutoff and comes back through this long acre battery through terminal, which ends up in the scuttle panel. And the cable runs under the wiper motor and the washer bottle. It goes through the drain hole in the scuttle and ends up in this conduit into this connection block here. This is the factory fuse here, and I've maintained this only because it just allows me to have um, a little bit more length there and mount it on this uh, dodgily fabricated bracket. That wraps the wiring up then, so appreciate that, that wasn't the most interesting episode ever, but a very crucial part of this build that I wanted to go over, just in case people were wondering about a few aspects of how I had done everything. Thank you very much for watching this episode, and uh, make sure you check out the rest of the turbo conversion series, and I will see you in another episode very soon soon.